All right, we're going to begin tonight with a report on the attack at sea in the Gulf of Oman. Did you hear about this? This is the type of story that should cause alarm bells, ding, 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 to go off for anybody who has a sense of history or a sense of geopolitical Machiavellianism, if nothing else, that we should have gotten used to by now. This week, there seems to be an abundance almost of protests and resistance around the globe. Why is it happening? And why is it getting, of course, so little attention? Because most people don't cover the news, uh, at least not international news. Here, let, let, let me take you through some of these. Hong Kong's last battle, hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets, protesting against a bill that would give mainland China more power. It was meant to be peaceful. But this morning, thousands of protesters on Hong Kong streets clashing with riot police. After hours of chanting and song, police moved in to disperse the crowds. Fighting for their future and met with full force. There were more clashes today in the streets of Hong Kong. Protesters are outraged over a proposal to send criminal suspects to mainland China for prosecution. But for protesters, the battle isn't over until the bill is dropped. They claim this front line has freedom at stake. We're here to support a better future for our kids. But it's a small kind of sting when your future's at stake. I think there's no hope, but we still need to continue. To fight, against, to fight against the big Beijing government and protect our city and our future. Major intersections in central Hong Kong transformed into front lines as violent confrontations between riot police and pro-democracy protesters escalated throughout the day. They came after more than one million people marched in Hong Kong over the government's proposed extradition bill. If passed, anyone here could be extradited to mainland China. Protesters rammed the police front line. They pushed back with batons, pepper spray and water guns. <laughs> Hundreds camped out on the streets near the government headquarters. A three-hour standoff ensued with streets blocked in central Hong Kong. If I'm an American and I did something bad here, I could potentially be extradited to China. Well, you don't ha even have to do anything bad. What is to stop China from making up evidence? Well, we want to protect our children. We want to protect our future, our next generation. So we have to say what, what we need to be done. We lose our freedom, so that's why we have to come here to protest. This is our last chance to protest. What's amazing is the communication between the protesters. Now that this has happened here, this tear gas is here, they're going to roll back and then they're going to tell everyone well behind that this has happened so everybody will push back. Hong Kong people are more prepared and determined than ever in any single point of Hong Kong history. Something here at Hong Kong University you won't see anywhere on mainland China. A memorial of the massacre in Tiananmen Square. In fact, the largest gathering of people in Hong Kong before these recent protests took place just after that massacre 30 years ago this month. And so it started. tear gas and blast bombs scattering the crowds. Protesters insist there will be more demonstrations against the president's right-wing policies. A general strike, nationwide protests, some turning violent, but all aimed at the government of Jair Bolsonaro swept across Brazil. The last to take place in Rio, where thousands gathered to march on the city's main train station. The arrival of so-called black bloc anarchists in the midst of more mainstream demonstrators all but guaranteed violence here. From the skies, police helicopters monitored the protesters as the march was slowly but surely dismantled on the ground. This was the president's first general strike since taking office in January. He'll likely face many more. And now, let's do this. Let's go over to Albania. Ladies and 
Can you believe this? I mean, all of this going on since Friday. These protests are because their elections were canceled. The, pro the, the president of the country recently stopped the election. That hardly ever is going to go over well. Uh, he said he had to do it, though, ease the political tensions. Thousands of Albanians took to the streets, some tossing Molotov cocktails at the police. And now, from Albania... ...to the military crackdown in Sudan today, the worst violence since the overthrow of the country's president in April. We're moving on to the ongoing crisis in Sudan. Uh, the ruling military has acknowledged that security forces committed violations when dispersing protesters. The demonstrations come two months after the country's repress repressive leader, President al-Bashir, was ousted and jailed. Now the people are demanding a transition to civilian rule and a free election. Protesters accuse Sudan's notorious rapid support forces, headed by General Hameti, of ordering the violent crackdown. He's the deputy leader of the transitional council that has been in charge since Omar al-Bashir was deposed in April. 24 hours earlier, he was filmed making a veiled threat to protesters who want to see civilian rule. We must firmly stand up to the ongoing chaos and build a true state. As for the civil state, the protesters are demanding to be truly a civil rule with no individuals above it. It must be built on the rule of law. It must be ruled by law and no one is above the law. If this chaos continues, it won't be a civil state. It will be anarchy. Kazakhstan. A new president was recently elected and this is how the people there reacted. Watch. Mr. Tokayev won the election with 71% of the vote. Look at what happened on the streets. People seem to think he's too closely aligned to the ex-president, Nazarbayev. He was there for some 30 years, by the way. 500 protesters were arrested. All right, next. Across America tonight calls for calm in Memphis after a night of violent protests. At least 25 police officers have been injured in Memphis after demonstrators in the city threw bricks at police during a protest over the death of an African-American man. The turmoil broke out Wednesday as U.S. Marshals shot and killed 20-year-old Brandon Weber, who was wanted on multiple charges. Chaos erupting in Memphis overnight. What started as a protest over the shooting death of 20-year-old Brandon Weber by U.S. Marshals developing into violence. Demonstrators throwing bricks at police and vandalizing squad cars. Police say marshals with the Fugitive Task Force tried to arrest Weber outside a home when he jumped into a car and tried to take off. People poured into the street after the shooting, throwing bottles and rocks at police. The situation escalated quickly and officers were forced to use tear gas on the crowd. Investigators say the man resisted arrest and pulled out a weapon. His identity has not been released. To Moldova. I don't know, the protest here seems, you know, uh, milder, maybe more peaceful nonetheless. Uh, look at the number of people that take to the streets here. They were called after the pro-Russian president was stripped of his duties. Protesters have taken to the streets, but officially they say it could have been much worse. Still, authorities fear that violence could get worse and uh, in what is one of Europe's poorest countries. Now, finally, let's take you staying in this hemisphere to uh, Venezuela. President Maduro has uh, reopened the border to Colombia. Thousands of people immediately, it's like they knew it was kind of come or something. They Suddenly thousands of people started crossing the bridge. They're going over there uh, to buy food, medicine, and other household items. Police tried to organize it as best they could so they can get through. Violence has not occurred, but the situation obviously remains tense as U.S.-backed uh, uh, President Juan Guaido continues his press uh, his uh, claim, I should say, as the president of Venezuela. I know, it's confusing. Sounds like a, a perfect segment, doesn't it? All this going on in the world. The White House is pointing a finger at Iran after a pair of oil tankers were attacked in the Gulf of Oman yesterday. Now, this is a month after four tankers were attacked in the Gulf, not far from the UAE port of Fujairah. Two were Saudi tankers, the others 
uh, from the UAE and Norway. The Iranian mission to the UN categorically rejects the US claim Tehran attacked the vessels. The Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Sarif in a tweet condemned the United States for engaging in what he called sabotage diplomacy. The Norwegian-owned Front Altair and Japanese-owned Kukuka Courageous experienced explosions forcing crews to abandon ship and leave the vessels adrift in waters between the Gulf Arab states and Iran. The attack occurred a few miles off the coast of Iran, close to the Strait of Hormuz, an economically and strategically vital waterway through which a third of the world's seaborne oil passes. According to Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, the ships were, quote, Japan-related. Iranian television has showed us this video, which is believed to be of that ship I mentioned, the Front Altair. Uh, it was carrying 23 crew. It had picked up oil in Abu Dhabi. It was heading for Taiwan. Now, interestingly, Taiwan's state oil company says it is believed to have been hit by a torpedo. Late last night, the Pentagon released this video. Officials say it shows members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard removing an unexploded mine from the hull of the Kokuka Courageous, a Japanese vessel. The hull's in law. However, the owner of that ship says its crew saw flying objects prior to the explosion, suggesting mines were not involved. The attacks happened as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe met with Iranian leaders in Tehran. Prime Minister Abe made a trip, a historic trip to Iran, to ask the regime to de-escalate and enter into talks. Iran's Supreme Leader rejected Prime Minister Abe's diplomacy today by saying he has no response to President Trump and will not answer. It was the first time in decades a Japanese PM visited Iran. In the United States, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo placed the blame firmly on Iran. Iran's UN mission issued a statement denying any involvement in the attacks, calling the accusation, quote, Iranophobic. But the owner of one of the tankers says before the attack, the crew saw flying objects, suggesting mines were not the cause. Both were carrying oil products when they were rocked by explosions. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo blamed Iranian mines. So, like just within an hour of these reports, our uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo hurries to the microphones where he appears on television to announce that all of our intelligence and all of our evidence points to Iran as the culprit, which of course the compliant news media in the United States repeats as gospel without any apparent pushback. And by the way, it may be completely true. Iran, of course, responds to this accusation, pointing out that the attack occurred while Iranian officials were having a historic and very friendly meeting. You saw it right here on our air with Japanese officials. So they're saying, why the hell would we bomb a ship that is Japanese when we're sitting here having a conversation with the Japanese prime minister? It's a question that's worth throwing into the mix, right? Regardless of how the attack occurred, the bottom line is the same. At the end of the day, this will create more instability in the Gulf region. It's not going to help things at all. And when there's less instability in the Gulf region, for Americans, that means potentially higher prices of their gas pump and uh, potential uh, for conflict should this escalate. Today, the issue of security has a special importance, either in the sensitive region of the Persian Gulf or Middle East and all around the world. And we have been making efforts to protect peace and security of the region. And over the last few years, practically, we have proven that we care about the security of our neighbours and all other countries. Former Pentagon official Michael Malouf believes the attacks were meant to send a strong message. There are no coincidences. I mean, this, is, uh, this was all staged and was meant to send a message. The ships were not meant to be sunk, as I, as I interpret things. And if you're going to try and, 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 and look at what the cause was, go back to where the ships originated. Someone had to know what was the manifest, who the ship owners were. I mean, this, was, this had to be some, whoever had access to that kind of information could have planned this thing. But exactly what happened and why? That is still not clear. And there's something else involved here. You know, uh, in law school, they say you should be skeptical, try and resist being cynical. I almost argue that we can't help but be cynical as journalists in this situation. In fact, look at what I just said in my open that happened as a result of us not questioning those things. You could argue the Spanish-American War changed the world completely, as did the Vietnamese War, right? Yeah. And yeah. people did not question. We should question in these cases because th th the results can be dire. 
I, I think I think the the media in particular do have that duty. Of course, they're they're complicit rather than skeptical, not to mention cynical. Yeah. Uh, and do these people deserve the benefit of the doubt? I don't think so. Not just from journalists, but from citizens. Yeah.